The nymph Amalthea and the goat that raised Jupiter in a cave on a diet of milk and honey was commissioned in 1785 by King Louis XVI for Queen Mary Antoinette. Both died by the guillotine in 1793. King Louis XVI was the last king of France before the fall of the monarchy during the French Revolution. The first part of Louis XVI's reign was marked by attempts to reform the French government, such as abolishing serfdom, reducing instances of the death penalty, and increasing tolerance for non-Catholics. In an attempt to end the state monopoly on grain, King Louis deregulated the grain market to make bread cheaper for the poor. Unfortunately, a subsequent bad harvest resulted in an increase in bread prices and food scarcity, prompting the masses to revolt, contributing greatly to the unpopularity of the monarchy. But he certainly was not the greedy tyrant that many historians claim he was. King Louis cut back spending and government expenditures, such as removing allowances for aristocrats who were not really serving the state. He improved the legal system, making the courts much more fair than they had been, improved conditions in the prisons, abolished torture, and ended forced labor in France. He provided free medical care to the poor and granted civil rights to Protestants. Keep in mind that France was a Catholic nation at the time. King Louis did have to implement an unpopular tax on the rich, however, because France came to the aid of the colonials fighting for independence against the British crown, which France was never compensated for, and this was weaponized by the revolutionaries to form an anger against the monarchy. Mary Antoinette was the last queen of France before the French Revolution. She was born an Archduchess of Austria, and after eight years of marriage to King Louis XVI, she started having children. She became increasingly unpopular among the people, however, as propaganda emerged, accusing her of being immoral and promiscuous, as well as other false accusations that damaged her reputation, none of which was ever proven, most of which was of a degenerate sexual nature. The queen attempted to fight back with counter-propaganda, portraying her as a caring mother most notably in painting showing her with her children, but the political situation worsened, and after a mob invaded the royal palace, massacring the Swiss guard, then beheading a princess, and affixing her head on a pike, parading it through the streets. On September 21, 1792, the fall of the monarchy was officially declared, and on January 21, 1793, King Louis XVI was condemned to death by guillotine and executed. Marie Antoinette was tried by the Revolutionary Tribunal on the 14th of October, 1793, and among the accusations were orchestrating orgies in Versailles, incest, and other unproven accusations. Early on the 16th of October, 
Mary Antoinette was declared guilty of three main charges against her. Depletion of the national treasury, conspiracy against internal and external security of the state, and high treason because of her intelligence activities in the interests of the enemy. Mary Antoinette was guillotined at 12.15 p.m. on October 16, 1793. The phrase, let them eat cake, is often attributed to Mary Antoinette, allegedly uttered after she was told that the peasants had no bread, but there's no evidence that she ever uttered it, and it's now generally regarded as a journalistic cliché. That said, after the French Revolution, the Jesuit priest, Augustine Bariel, wrote that Freemasons had actively prepared the 1789 Revolution, with many contemporary writers claiming that the Freemasonry in France were the driving force behind the revolution itself. John Robison was a physicist and professor of natural philosophy at the University of Edinburgh. In his 1797 book, titled Proofs of a Conspiracy Against All the Religions and Governments of Europe, carried on in the secret meetings of Freemasons, Illuminati, and reading societies, Robison argues that the Illuminati had infiltrated continental Freemasonry, leading to the excesses of the French Revolution. In 1798, the Reverend G. W. Snyder sent Robison's book to George Washington for his thoughts on the subject, in which he replied to him in a letter, quote, I have heard much of the nefarious and dangerous plan and doctrines of the Illuminati, but never saw the book until you were pleased to send it to me. It was not my intention to doubt that the doctrines of the Illuminati and principles of Jacobinson had not spread in the United States. On the contrary, no one is more truly satisfied of this fact than I am. Founded in 1789, 13 years after the Illuminati and allegedly influenced by them, the Jacobins were left-wing revolutionaries who aimed to end the reign of King Louis XVI and establish a French Republic. They were the most radical political faction involved in the French Revolution that saw 16,594 people being guillotined, including the royal family, and 2,640 people executed in Paris alone. One of their central tenets was secularism, which means the elimination of a noble class through wealth redistribution and the subversion of existing religions in favor of all human affairs run by the totalitarian state. Their motto was liberty, equality, and fraternity, a slogan that was a forerunner for radical Marxist ideology, mirrored in modern times in meaning by the communist terms diversity, equity, and inclusion, which promotes anti-nationalist sentiment, anti-traditionalist values, and what essentially today amounts to anti-white racism. In his book, To Eliminate the Opiate, Rabbi Marvin Antelman says, quote, There is no argument about the relationship between the Illuminati and the Jacobins, who executed the terror during the French Revolution. There is also no argument among prominent Judaic scholars as to the continuum that existed between Jewish-born heretics who were followers of the false messiah, Sabbatai Zevi, through his successors, the radical practitioners of the Sabbatean cult, called the Frankist, named after their founder, Jacob Frank, the Jacobians, and the Reform Movement, which is progressive liberal Judaism. We furthermore have the testimony of John Robison in his Proofs of a Conspiracy, published in 1798, which details the development of the Illuminati and its rise to power, their connection with the Jacobins, and with the terror that took place during the French Revolution. Robison presents a list of lodges of the Illuminati existing primarily in Germany, with a few in England, Scotland, Poland, Switzerland, France, and Italy, as well as America. He also gives names of members. Some of the more important Illuminati mentioned by Robison 
were given code names. These code names were based, for the most part, on classical Greek and Roman personalities who were known for their ruthlessness and cynicism. Weishaupt's own code name was Spartacus, the man who headed the insurrection of slaves and kept Rome in terror and uproar for three years. In addition to Robison's work, there also exists the writings of Abe Augustin Barrow, who wrote memoirs illustrating the history of Jacobitanism in 1799. Robison traces the Illuminati to an aberration in Freemasonry started by Adam Weishaupt. The radicalism of the Illuminati was manifested in public and in private. Their goal was to abolish Christianity and overturn all civil government. Weishaupt is rather verbose about his anti-religious philosophy. He felt that Freemasonry is concealed Christianity and that Christ should be substituted with the word reason. He then calls for a new religion and a new state government, which explains Masonic symbols and combines them in one degree. He advocates a slow overthrow of religion so that the fanatics will not be alarmed and will not be aware of what is going on. Of Jewish mysticism, he declares, quote, The Jewish theosophy was a mystery like the Lucinian or the Pythagorean, unfit for the vulgar. Ramesson offers an interesting insight into why the Illuminati were interested in setting up sisterhoods and promoting women's liberation. Citing some of the Illuminati philosophers, he feels that the female mind is well adapted to cultivation. The new order, by changing the women, could hopefully force the sentiments of men to change. End quote. But to truly understand the Illuminati, one must consider the motives of its founders. Besides Adam Weishaupt, there was substantial financial backing from the Rothschild banking dynasty, who according to Rabbi Marvin Antelman, were Frankists, which is named after Jacob Frank, the successor to Sabbatai Zevi, who declared himself Messiah on June 18th, the sixth month and 18th day, which is six plus six plus six, in the year 1666, in the 17th century, Zevi amassed over a million followers, proclaiming that certain aspects of Jewish law were no longer binding. He married a Polish prostitute named Sarah in an attempt to conform to a legend that the Messiah would marry an unchaste bride. He was then officially excommunicated by the rabbis of his generation but this only strengthened his movement and hardened his followers. After a failed attempt to oppose the sultan that controlled Palestine, Sabbatai was arrested and given a choice between death and converting to Islam. He chose the latter and converted, along with a portion of his followers, who also became Muslim, while practicing their heretical form of Judaism in secret. Their descendants today are a sect in Turkey known as the Donme. Turkey is ruled by the secret society Donme. You can check this on the internet. They are Jews who converted to Islam in 1666. Mind you, 1666. In the 17th century, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st century, for five centuries, Turkey has been ruled by the secret society, Donme. Let me explain who they are. A guy called Sabatai Zevi, a charismatic Jew, handsome, two meters tall, being familiar with magic, a good speaker, travels around Turkey. Although people know that he's a friend of the English and keeps boasting, I will establish a Jewish state, he is supported by the Sufis by the Kabbalists. Everyone admires him. So he has 50,000 followers, and the majority of them live in Thessaloniki. Sultan hears about this and orders his servants to arrest him and tells him, you fool, or something like that. Do I hear that you're talking about establishing a Jewish state in Turkish territory? Hey, back then it stretched all the way to North Africa and half of Asia. 
How are you going to establish a Jewish state here? Who's spreading this nonsense? And are you insulting me? I will order my servants to cut off your head, since you are a subversive element. Hold on, dear Sultan, I want to tell you something. If you cut my head off, you will enrage the Jews in London, Paris, Berlin, who are all interconnected, and they will overthrow you, cutting your own head off. Brother will become Sultan, or perhaps your son will change in Turkey, while you and I will be headless. So let me make a suggestion. Spare my head, and I will do my best to restore your honor by neglecting stupidities that I talked about. What is it that you're suggesting, says the Sultan? I will denounce my Jewish faith and will publicly convert. I'll say Allah Akbar. I will bow and accept it. The Sultan smiled and said, All right, do it. And he really did it. He converted to Islam. But his 50,000 followers, who were Jews, also converted to Islam. In five years, I've infiltrated every existing poor in the state, taking full control of it. And ever since, Turkey has been ruled by the secret society, Donme, comprised of Jews, who number 20,000, but are perfectly distributed. Thus, Kemal Atatürk was born in Thelesaniki and educated in Bitola, who also probably spoke Serbian, a wise man, of course, a Freemason. And the Order of the English amputated the old Turkish and created a new Turkish nation switched to the Latin alphabet and modernized Turkey. Since then, up until today, Turkey has been ruled by the Jewish Donme. So Mr. Erdogan says that he feels at home in Sarajevo and that Sarah Pristina are Turkish and so on. He's a member of the secret society Donme, just like his former Minister of Foreign Affairs, Abdullah. All of you Bosniaks can easily check this. Contact your countrymen in Turkey. Ask them via phone, Skype. If that what this Dejan Luke claims is true, that Erdogan is actually a Jew. The order maintained that the Messiah would have to sin before he could bring redemption, and this provided a rationale for believing in the Jewish Messiah who was of Islam. This brings us back to Jacob Frank, who encountered the Donmet while he was traveling as a salesman in Turkey. He refined the concept of the Messiah sinning by urging members of his movement to sin, reasoning that if salvation could be gotten through purity, it could also be achieved through sin. One of the ways that the Frankists indulged in their sin was to engage in sexual orgies. As I said earlier, the Rothschilds are said by Rabbi Antelman, to be Frankists. Can Stanley Kubrick's 1999 movie called Eyes Wide Shut, starring Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman, a scene depicts a mass party that involves a seemingly satanic orgy. The ritual is appropriately shot inside of the Rothschild mansion, where the ceremony takes place during the Christmas season, involving 12 women in a circle which speaks to the ancient pre-Christian winter solstice gatherings, such as Saturnalia, which I covered in a recent video. Of course, this film is not fiction, but satire, and is meant to mimic and possibly expose covert realities. Who do you think those people were? Those were not just ordinary people there. If I told you their names, I'm not going to tell you their names, but if I did, I don't think you'd sleep so well. Broken baby doll heads and torn limbs scattered across tables, edible mannequins arranged to look like corpses, and the host wearing a menacing horned mask. These are actual photos taken at an Illuminati ball in the 1970s, hosted by none other than the Rothschilds. 
The leaked pictures depict the scene, eerily similar to Stanley Kubrick's 1999 movie, Eyes Wide Shut. Had Kubrick himself been a witness to these elite mansion parties? Kubrick died just days after showing his film to the studio, and many believe he was killed for his daring expose. And what was in the mysterious 24 minutes the studio cut from the film? He died a day after refusing to cut 24 minutes of it. Well, they cut it. You better believe they cut out of this film. From ancient Luciferian rituals to cannibalism and human sacrifice, what really goes on at these elite mansion partings? The year was 1972, and the Rothschild mansion outside of Paris looked like it was in flames. Huge, flickering orange lights projected a fiery inferno across the main edifice. It was all part of the preparation for a mass ball they were hosting and the guest list read like a who's who of the Illuminati. Artists, fashion designers, celebrities, and royalty were greeted by men in cap masks who guided them to the main room where Marie Helen de Rothschild waited wearing an elaborate deer head mask with ornate horns jutting from the top. The invites were written backwards and required a mirror to read reflecting an occult or Kabbalistic edict to do everything backwards or inverted. Alarming photos taken from the event have surfaced, showing their bizarre costumes and questionable decorations, such as baby dolls strung on tables as part of the decor, and perhaps the weirdest pictures of men gathered around a nude female epigee, allegedly made of edible cake, laid out on what looks to be a sacrificial altar. The menu from the strange event also hints at cannibalistic undertones. Kubrick even filmed the salacious scenes to his movie inside an actual Rothschild mansion. But the film is not the movie Kubrick wanted audiences to see. The studio demanded 24 minutes of the original to be cut. Much speculation has been made about what might have been in that 24 minutes. Officially, Warner Brother claimed that editing was necessary in order to obtain an R rating. This explanation does not make sense, however, given that such a significant portion of a final cut film. 24 minutes is more than random clips. It's more likely that an entire scene was removed, a scene that could have been the climax of the entire movie, one that made all others make sense. After all, it was important enough that Kubrick refused to remove it. A call, and he claimed to be Kubrick's, one of Kubrick's top assistants before he died. In other words, he was there all the way to the end. Wow, that's getting good. <laughs> and he told me Kubrick uh, kept muttering to, him, to himself that the uh, Warner Brothers executives uh, were going to hate his film. Uh, and literally, he quoted me as saying, uh, when they see this film, they're going to kill me. Then, on the night that they, he showed them the film in London, um, strangely enough, he had taken up smoking again, which he'd been a chain smoker earlier in life, and he kind of slowed down, but apparently, you know, much to this guy's surprise, he was, he was chaining again. And uh, uh, he waited in the lobby, really kind of pale and distant, and then the movie ended, and the door opened, and... Somebody walked out and said, Stanley, you need you come down here. And the door shut. And this guy said that he heard yelling for about 45 minutes, screaming and yelling. And he heard Kubrick say that, oh, you know, you can't change my film. It's in my contract. And then Kubrick stormed out first and he followed Stanley. And uh, that was the last time we ever saw Stanley. Wow. Look at Eyes Wide Shut, Stanley Kubrick who you better believe got invited to, to things like this. And then there's names very similar to George Soros in it as, you know, the bad guy character. And his wife, he finds out, is really an occultist. And they he died a day after refusing to cut 24 minutes of it. Well, they cut it. You better believe they cut out of this film. The, the fact that Stanley died uh, exactly 666 days before January 1st, 2001, the first day of the <laughs> year of his greatest film, I, that worries me, I have to tell you. Um, I think that's a signal, and I hope 
to you know the heavens above that it, he wasn't murdered but somehow that seems like an illuminati signal what else did kubrick show in those 24 minutes most rumors contend that it had something to do with the shocking illuminati mansion party this type of event actually dates back to ancient times such as the greek and roman bacchanalia festival which involved masked orgies as part of the invocation of pagan gods. The old moneyed European aristocrats have been secretly attending such events for hundreds of years. In fact, Trom Novelle, the story from which Kubrick based the screenplay, was about a couple who experiences a similar party in upper class Austria around the turn of the century. Austria is near the Bavarian region of Germany, where the original Bavarian Illuminati was founded. One of the mysterious women who leads Bill off introduces herself as Noala Windsor, Kichina Noala Windsor, alluding to British royalty and their association with the Cabal. One mask in particular is said to bear a resemblance to Bob Hope, who has been named by whistleblowers as an NK Ultra handler. Before today, you refrain from naming names. Would you like to tell us uh, who was involved in these various activities that you've described before? Yes, I would, Ted. Um, it's real scary for me, but I'd like to... Um, go on public record saying that um, my owner under mind control was um, Bob Hope and that um, I was abused and used as a mind control sex slave. Still, others speculate Kubrick may have exposed the satanic elite, proving there's a much more sinister side to these secret parties. Was this what Kubrick was really trying to warn us about? He had already alluded to this theme when Bill goes to the costume shop and encounters a father prostituting his underage daughter. The name of the costume shop is Rainbow Fashions. Rainbows, rainbow symbolism, and Wizard of Oz themes are all related to MK Ultra mind control. And lending credence to this theory is a conversation which allegedly occurred between Nicole Kidman and the acclaimed filmmaker Stanley Kubrick. Kidman claims he told her how the world really works and who is in charge behind the scenes while filming the movie Eyes Wide Shut. If this is what Kubrick exposed in those 24 minutes, no wonder he ended up dead. However, Nicole was never as naive to this sordid world as she may have acted. Her father, Anthony Kidman, was a high-level Luciferian himself, a member of Aleister Crowley's notorious Ordo Templi Orientis, a group that engages in ritual sex magic and ancient pagan rites. He died mysteriously after an Australian named Fiona Barnett formally named him at Parliament House Canberra and to an international leader at Fairbairn Military Airport. The people involved in this elite ring included high-ranking politicians, police and judiciary. Kidman's stardom makes a lot more sense once we know about her elite connections and it should come as no surprise that Kubrick cast her in the film Eyes Wide Shut. His use of a real-life couple at the time, who was also connected to a real Illuminati family, hints to the audience that this movie is not really fiction at all. Few filmmakers spark more fascination or intrigue than Stanley Kubrick. Known for his controversial films and unique vision, Kubrick forever changed filmmaking, but his films were much more than visual masterpieces. They used hidden messages and meanings to reveal secret truths about our world and those who run it. In Eyes Wide Shut, Kubrick revealed some of the darkest secrets of the Luciferian elite, from MK Ultra and human trafficking to real life Illuminati rituals. But revealing such secrets is a dangerous game, and one that for Kubrick may have proven 
deaden. Like the Romanov family was the last imperial dynasty to rule Russia. They first came to power in 1613, and over the next three centuries, 18 Romanovs took the Russian throne, including Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, Alexander I, and Nicholas II. During the Russian Revolution of 1917, Bolshevik revolutionaries toppled the monarchy, ending the Romanov dynasty. Tsar Nicholas II and his entire family, including his young children, were later executed by Bolshevik troops. Led by Vladimir Lenin, the Bolsheviks would later become the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. This revolution of 1917 and the civil war that followed was one of the most explosive political events of the 20th century, slaughtering between 30 to 50 million Russians in one of the cruelest and most violent genocides in recorded world history. The Bolsheviks were a radical, far-left, and Marxist faction that eliminated any resistance, occupied government buildings and other strategic locations, then making Lenin dictator of the world's first communist state. This bloody Russian revolution paved the way for the rise of communism as an influential political belief system around the world, spreading to places like China, which had its own Marxist revolution with estimates of 80 million deaths, ushering in the People's Republic of China. Whether we're talking about China or Russia, Marxist revolutions start the same way, with an effort to divide the population and pit them against each other. This can be done by race, gender, or class, but will always focus on perceived inequalities in society with promises of a more fair, just, and egalitarian distribution of wealth and resources among the citizens. While this sounds good on paper, especially in places where extreme discrepancies exist in a society's standard of living, the new order never delivers on its promises and eventually resembles the old order, except with power changing hands to a less competent and ineffective form of totalitarian rule. Karl Marx is considered by many to be the father of communism, credited with having authored in 1848, along with Frederick Engels, the Communist Manifesto, which advocated for a classless system in which all property and wealth are communally rather than privately owned, becoming the basis of what is known as Marxism. That said, Karl Marx did not actually originate the Communist Manifesto. He was paid for his services by the League of the Just, which was a German secret society, which later evolved into the International Communist Party. To understand the true origins of the League of the Just, or Bund der Gerchen, as it was called in German, and therefore the true origins of communism, one must understand the esoteric origins of the organization that is behind the hidden hand. The Illuminati was founded on May 1, 1776, 100 years after the death of Sabatai Zevi, Adam Weishaupt, an ex-Jesuit law professor in Bavaria, conceived of a society loosely based on Plato's Republic, where civilization would be composed of three classes, the workers, the military, and the ruling elite. The ruling elite would be comprised of a mystery class with grades and memberships, consisting of priest, prince, magician, and king. The general public thinks that communism caters to the working class and do not seem to realize that wealthy, powerful men, its priests and kings, secretly manipulate and control most communist governments while living in free societies. Among this class are the Rockefellers, Morgans, Schiffs, Warburgs, and most of the Rothschilds. These powerful people conceive of themselves 
as masterminds and rulers of a new world order, which they believe will eventually succeed and supersede all governments. Their plan calls for the complete elimination of marriage and the family, so that all women would belong to all men, and all men would belong to all women. The then communist state would therefore promote and encourage sexual depravity and immorality in its societies, which would include alternative lifestyles that would weaken the traditional family unit. This would obviously necessitate the subversion of spirituality and religious freedoms, which bring us back to Jacob Frank, who like Zevi before him, that converted to Islam, himself along with thousands of his followers converted to Catholicism in 1759, not only for the purpose of imitating their Sabbatine role model, but in an effort to subvert and destroy the faith from within. The elite ruling class to initiation and membership would be given the secret keys to Kabbalistic Tantra and internal alchemy through techniques of harnessed orgasm and semen retention, while the working masses would be encouraged to constantly fornicate through vices like freely available porn, promiscuity, and various forms of immorality and alternative lifestyles. He taught that one could appear to be a religious Jew or some other religious denomination on the outside and in reality be a Frankist or influenced by them, pushing a secular, liberal, progressive, communist, far-left ideology to usher in a global, totalitarian state. Rabbi Marvin Antelman writes, quote, While Gershom Sholem seems to have lost the Frankists somewhere in Warsaw in the 1920s, and a Donme in Salonika during World War II with the extermination of the Jews there, I have found their descendants in the United States to be very active in Marxist, Leninist, and Third World activities. They have attempted to convert the civil rights movement into a black revolution and are attempting to further polarize this country by promoting women's liberation. The Frankists today no longer call themselves by that name. The organization has grown into an international group labeled by outsiders as the cult of the all-seeing eye. In the United States, they're most active in Boston, New York, Washington, and San Francisco. Their ranks and sponsors include some very famous people, numbering diplomats, senators, governors, and clergymen in their ranks. They also agitate for abortion on demand, which according to Judaism is murder, as well as for affirmative action hiring of special minorities. Suffice it to say that the Frankists and their elite played a leading role in the development of communism and that they continue to be an elite today within the wider communist circle, but nevertheless tend to be standoffish, arming a clique within a clique, as they did during the latter 18th and 19th centuries when they chose to make Illuminati Masonic lodges their stomping grounds. In Jewish circles, they dominate the reform movement at many levels, the Anti-Defamation League and the conservative movement at the highest level. In the book titled Jerusalem, a treaty on ecclesiastical authority in Judaism by Moses Mendelssohn, who was a Sabbatine Frankist thought promoted secular progressive reform Judaism. On page 257 of volume one, it says, quote, the chiefs of the sect carry about them a badge or medal by which they make themselves known to one another and to the members. It is of the size of a half-crown piece and coined to the Abraham coin mentioned in the Talmud. A characteristic of the divide-and-conquer psychology of the communist movement has been its ability to instigate divisiveness amongst groups. Over the years it has fomented revolution by accentuating differences between blacks and whites, youths and elders, landlords and tenants, Christians and Jews, Muslims and Christians, and with the advent of women's lib between men and women, even husband and wife. One tactic that the reform movement desires to implement, which is another way of saying secular, progressive, or liberal, was to divide Jews, and this was achieved through the introduction of reform or secular Judaism, meaning communist, socialist, atheist, and egalitarian globalism without borders 
or nationalist or ancestral identity 